Somebody shout yes or no. Yes, Nick. yes, oh, can good. see it. Okay, excellent. Right, so uh, my name is Nick. I'm a paediatric surgeon. I work at St Mary's and, and Chelsea sometimes as well and wherever else I'm allowed to work. So I'm going to talk to you about major trauma and the way that I'm going to talk to you about major trauma is assume that you know everything about looking after children. So I'm not giving this as a trauma in children, so I'm giving this as a how to look after children with abdominal wounds for people who are already smart and know about children. Okay, so that's the slant we're going for. All right, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the principles of trauma management. I'm going to talk to you about penetrating versus blunt injuries. We're going to talk about investigations, which is really simple. And we're going to talk about some management strategies. Is that all right? Everyone happy? Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Let's begin. Right. So first case, 12 year old boy. This was really sad, actually. Um, the call was from Hems, and he had fallen from a height, and it was probably about two stories onto concrete. And he was being brought in by Hems, which is always a bad start to anyone's uh, day. Um, the, the history what is behind Hems? this was it? Hems what does is Hems stand for? Fantastic, oh. I'm glad you asked. So the Hems is the Helicopter Hems. Emergency Service. Oh. Okay. okay, and in order in order for Hems to get involved with you, you have to be have either a very significant injury. So Hems, the helicopter emergency service, are triggered by London ambulance or by the police. So either of them can turn around in a turn up at a scene and say, "Oh my goodness, it needs Hems." Or sometimes uh, the nine 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 operator will activate Hems, but usually it's from the other emergency services first. Um, the HEMS team uh, is a doctor, a HEMS doctor, a HEMS paramedic, and uh, usually one other person plus someone who flies the helicopter around. Um, if you're in northwest London, uh, we don't have a helipad at Mary's, so they tend to land either in Hyde Park or a little park just opposite the waterway. If you're at the Royal London, they'll land on top of the Royal London. If you're at George's, they land in a little field in the middle of St George's. And if you are at Kings, they land on a helipad. Everyone ever seen hems? Anyone seen them flying around? Yes, Nick, I saw them. Yes, no, the helipad. I've never, yeah, it's pretty cool. Do you know what's special about that helicopter? Nope. There's a fun fact about the helicopter. That, that helicopter doesn't have a tail rotor. It has a different thing which keeps it from stable and the reason for that is that when they started off doing the uh, helicopter transfers and things uh, somebody walked into a tail rotor because they didn't see it because it was spinning around so quickly. So the HEMS helicopters do not have a tail rotor, they have some sort of complicated airstream thing. Isn't that interesting? Not really, but it is quite interesting. Okay, so this poor little boy, he's a 12 year old boy, and it transpired that basically he was sitting on his windowsill because he had so many presents from his birthday on his desk and he was doing some reading. And unfortunately, there was a latch on a window that the parents knew and hadn't fixed. Um, he leant back against the window and he fell onto a newly tarmacked patio. And multiple severe injuries, which is what we were expecting. Um, and so a code red was put out. Uh, do people know what a code red means? Really bad. Yeah, bad. Badness, fantastic, that's good. So a code red um, does a number of things. The first thing it does is it, it gets all the right people into the right place. And the thing about major trauma centers and the thing that about trauma management is it's all about the personnel. It's all about having everybody who needs to be there, the decision makers there at the outset uh, when the child comes or the adult comes in to recess. The code red also stimulates a number of other things to happen. So it starts a process where theatres will be notified that somebody needs to get the trauma theatre ready. It starts a cascade in blood bank to start to free up blood products, um, start to thaw um, uh, cryoprecipitate, uh, FFP, 
um, it, it, it is a precipitant. So when you say code red, not only do you mean this is really, really bad, you're going to expect that everybody you need to be there at a trauma call is there. Um, and you're also starting a number of other processes. So for example, the trauma scanner will be freed up, you know, in anticipation for a CT scan being performed. Okay, um, so uh, who would come to a code red? Who on a who's on a trauma team? An anesthetist. Yeah, some anesthetists. Surgeons. Surgeon. Some a bunch of surgeons. Which sort of surgeons turn up? Pediatric general. Yeah, or pediatric surgeons, general surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, brain surgeons often turn up. They're the neurosurgeons are part of the code red team. Um, cardiothoracic surgeons are usually notified uh, at our centre of excellence there down the road at the Hammersmith, um, but some of them are often here. Um, ED. So if you actually turn up to a code red, you end up finding an awful lot of people there. And it's actually quite intimidating, uh, particularly for sometimes if you bring the parents in, uh, which is a, a delicate thing. Anywho, uh, so you get lots of people there, lots of decision makers, and you have a trauma team leader who leads the code red. OK, um, uh, this child uh, had no output on arrival, uh, so we opened up their chest uh, and tried to get some output uh, by occluding their um, descending thoracic aorta. Um, which we did, and we got a bit of output back, and we ended up getting the child to theatre. Um, we expected there to be abdominal injuries, um, and we started, and they also had a significant head injury, so we went into our trauma theatre, and our trauma theatre is massive. It is able to accommodate uh, three theatre teams operating simultaneously, uh, multiple anaesthetic teams, uh, and while the uh, neurosurgeons did stuff to the head, uh, we started uh, an operation on the abdomen and we carried out something called damage control surgery. Has everyone ever heard of that before? No. no. So the principles of damage control to surgery. Uh, this is surgery for massive hemorrhage, often, which is why we've, we've got this problem. Um, there are three phases to damage control surgery. The first phase is the first operation that you do, and that is all about a life-saving thing. Okay, that means you get in and you get out and you do the bare minimum. It involves packing of the abdomen, stopping anything that's actively bleeding, um, and then getting them back to intensive care. Why, why is that so important that it's done rapidly? And I've written it there, but you can tell me about the triangle of terror which I think is a word that I invented, but it is a triangle of terror. It's probably a triad of something or other. Anybody, anybody? Just a stab in the dark, but the things I'd be thinking about is brain dim damage and kidney failure, and then potentially sort of reperfusion, but I don't know if that falls into what you're sort of getting at. So the reason that we want to go quickly is because of this. This is the triad of terribleness, mm. or Nick's triangle of terror. But essentially, we have a, we have this vicious circle. So we've got someone who's critically ill who is currently dying. They are acidotic by their very nature. That feeds into coagulopathy, so they bleed more. So you pour more products into them, and they're getting cold. They get hypothermic. That makes your coagulopathy worse and it makes your acidosis worse and this whole thing spirals. If you are operating for a long time the patient will die anyway. So the idea is is you control the absolute bare minimum that you need to do. You know if that or oh, Geraldine left she's bored. Um, if you um, if the spleen's bleeding you need to take the spleen out but if you've got things like damage to the bowel all you do is put some staples across it and come back for another day. So you get the patient back to intensive care unit and then the third phase is you come back and do definitive surgery. So damage control surgery, which is in the case of a code red, is all about just what it says. It's damage control surgery. This all came from uh, the military uh, and this understanding that actually uh, doing uh, what's necessary rather than definitive surgery is actually better for these patients. 
um, the outcomes from code red surgery in children and I guess you could argue that a 12 year old physiologically is probably closer to an adult but the outcomes from children from code red surgery nationally are very very poor okay so that would be my take-home message uh, that often this is sort of seen as sort of relatively heroic um, attempts um, but actually the outcomes are really really poor uh, we do get good outcomes occasionally um, but most of the time not okay super clear i don't super want you to clear. Learn, i don't want you to learn to be surgeons i want you to have an idea about what happens uh, in the case of a code red okay um managing major trauma managing abdominal trauma is all about the team okay and that's really really important to remember okay case two less bad 14 year old was hit and run uh, crossing a road uh, i'm pretty sure they were leaving school or something like that hems brought them in again we remember who they were lucas left as well that's sad he contributed lots um everyone remember who hems were yes we do excellent uh, had a normal ct head and at three hours into the department, he suddenly became tachycardic and pale with abdominal pain. What is everyone thinking? Planet rupture? Yeah, some sort of rupture. Yeah, fantastic. So, so something's happened. And what, what should have happened? Bleeding internally. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so absolutely, he, he's starting to hemorrhage. What was the problem with this patient? What, 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 what did they have? What sh did they not have? And what was the problem? Well, it sounds like they've had limited imaging. Um, yeah, and and has that has that worked out for the best for the patient? Depends on what's bleeding, doesn't it? <laughs> Probably not. Um, no, <laughs> They're going to get the imaging. So, okay, so this is this is the this is the take home message from this talk: is do the right image, don't compromise on the right imaging and trauma, and you won't get into trouble. Hi, Geraldine. Welcome back. Um, so um, everyone talks about um, CT scans and the risk benefit for them in the context of trauma, in the context of somebody who has an, an injury to their abdomen, which is significant, or even you think it might not be that significant, the correct investigation is a CT scan of their abdomen. What is not the correct investigation? There's no role for a plain film of the abdomen in trauma. Zero. Anything else that there's no role for? Ultrasound. Ultrasound. It is no role for ultrasound. All you are doing is delaying the patient getting the correct imaging, um, or you will be falsely reassured. So you're not acting in the best interest of the patient by not doing a CT scan. So we do a CT scan. Uh, does anybody know about CT scans? Hello. Anybody out uh, there? Definitely not. Um, excellent, spleen. fantastic. <laughs> I'm sorry? The spleen has some things in it. Yeah, the spleen looks a bit funny, doesn't it? So, so look, C CT scans, uh, uh, you know, really basically, you know, uh, depending on how dense the tissue are, depends on how bright the image is. Um, uh, I remember when I was in medical school, someone talking about boxes, and it's the computer adding up all the boxes and depending on how much uh, um, <laughs> X-rays are absorbed by the tissue or not, and that gives you your image. So this is the this is the liver. There are th the CT scans in trauma are done as three phases: uh, arterial phase, a portal venous phase, and a venous phase. And that tells you lots of different things. Uh, it's very important in telling you whether there is active bleeding, whether there's a blush of contrast, uh, and where the bleeding is coming from. So there is a very specific trauma series that has to be done. So this is your liver, which looks just fine. Uh, these are the blood vessels in the liver. This is, uh, what structure is this? That's the aorta. The aorta. So what phase of the CT scans I've taught you? There's arterial phase, venous phase, or portal venous phase. So which phase is this? If the aorta is obvious. Arterial. Fantastic, yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is an arterial phase CT scan. And, and here's the spleen, and the spleen shouldn't look like this. 
the spleen should have be the same homogeneous texture um, as the liver. Okay. Uh, the only caveat to this is that sometimes the spleen can look funky when you're quite young, um, and that's due to the blood flow through the liver, through the spleen. Excuse me. Okay, my spleen's my liver's wrong. So uh, we've got a significant splenic injury uh, in someone who is tachycardic and pale. So um, what does anyone do know about splenic injuries in children? Any facts we have? Why does the spleen rupture? Why does the spleen break? Lisa left, she got bored. Um, why does the spleen break like it does? And the vessels are a little bit mobile, like they are with the with the liver. I seem to remember dissecting cadavers and those vessels where they sort of um, it, the vessels are at the the larger blood vessels are quite delicate. They're not fixed. No, so, so so that's not why the spleen breaks into a million billion pieces. Uh, there is another reason. Is it because in children the spleen is slightly low, lower? So it's not as protected by the rib cage. Uh, so the spleen is protected by the rib cage. Uh, it lives under there. Uh, so that's not the reason. Uh, I will put you out of your misery, and it's going to make you even more miserable because it's all due to embryology, which, as we all remember at medical school, is taught incredibly well. Um, but um, uh, the embryology of the spleen is the spleen develops from lots of little tiny little spleens called splenunculi. Everyone heard of a splenunculus? It's one of their medical student facts. It's otherwise known as an accessory spleen. Sometimes you find them sitting in the amentum and stuff. It's the sort of thing that when you're a medical student and the consultant points it out to you and says, what's that? And you go, I know, and he tells you, and then that's it. Essentially, the spleen coalesces out of these multiple splenunculi, like multiple baby spleens, and that's why the spleen's nobbly. Did you know that? No, thank you. No, that is why the spleen is nobbly. Yeah. That is why this, and that's why the spleen fractures so easily because it breaks along these lines of the little splenunculi. There you go. So Fiona Lula, you flacked. Yeah, I know. There you go. We've learned something. If you've learned one thing, that splenunculi are cool, and that's why the spleen fractures. So, um, uh, do you know anything? Anything how we might grade splenic injuries? Is there four grades? Yeah, so, so there's four or five, depending on which system you use. And, and it was introduced uh, by um, the American Association of Pediatric Surgeons back in 2000. And the reason for that was so that people could compare and contrast and try to make some algorithms about how to manage trauma. Um, and it all basically is due to how bad it looks and how much of the organ is involved and whether it goes down to the hilum. As far as paediatrics goes, particularly for younger children, it doesn't seem to make a difference. So you can have a spleen that is totally smashed up like this and hemodynamically stable children. So the grading system in adults is quite prescriptive. If it's this grade of injury, you get this intervention. If it's this grade of injury, you don't. In children, by and large, we can manage everything conservatively. So that's the second learning point from today is we try and manage all abdominal injuries conservatively, particularly when it comes to blunt trauma. And the reason for that is, is that they tend to resolve by themselves. What's different about this 14 year old was that he's tachycardic and he's tender. And that tells you that there's active bleeding going on. So if that's the case, what are we gonna do? What are our options? Can you uh, so, so Fiona, Fiona Lula, maybe pronouncing that wrong, wants to do a splenectomy, which is a totally reasonable and rational. Finn, sorry, Finn. Uh, so, if this child was hemodynamically unstable and uh, was not responding to products and couldn't be fluid resuscitated, then I agree they need a laparotomy and then they need a splenectomy. So Kate says that even if he had the imaging initially, you saw this, you might not have taken him to theatre. If he had this imaging on arrival, I wouldn't do anything with them if they were well. 
if they suddenly start developing pain so that it looks like they're bleeding, then the next stage uh, would be to ask our interventional radiologists to angioembolize them. So you put a catheter in down the groin, uh, you come up to the spleen and you can selectively uh, embolize part of the spleen. And that's very effective. So in essence, we almost entirely remove splenectomy uh, from our equations in only the really sickest children get that. Okay, so we don't really ever want to get a splenectomy. The selective angioembolization um, is that the spleen afterwards, probably. Uh, the selective angioembolization um, is so good that actually you end up preserving splenic function. Um, so when we look for the spleen, and this is this child's spleen uh, at three months following the um, uh, following uh, the angioembolization, he's got a well uh, vascularized spleen. So AN asks, can I ask what you have done? Would you have done the imaging if you had no pain at all? Yes, absolutely. And th that is the take home message from this talk is that the correct imaging for children who have blunt abdominal trauma is a CT scan of their abdomen or you will miss things, 100% you will miss things and you will convert easily manageable um, conditions into potential code red conditions. Okay, so CT scan for everybody, please. Okay, if the mechanism is significant enough to have called out HEMS, they get a CT scan. They've CT their head, just keep going. All right, Kate asks, if you had embolization only, presumably you don't need antibiotic prophylaxis. That's exactly right, Katie, because you end up preserving splenic function. So when we ultrasound them, we can do some blood tests as well. And what's the blood test to see what your splenic function looks like or whether you're hyposplenic? There is something you can do as a surrogate. A blood film, that's correct. What are we looking for on the blood film? It's not reticulocytes. What does the spleen do? Who cares about the spleen? Old cells, you might do. How old jolly bodies? Yay, so inclusion bodies. Uh, 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 Finn, we, we got where you were at. Um, how old jolly bodies are, are the um, nucleolus uh, which should have been removed from the red cell, and that's what the spleen does. And if you have Howard Jolly bodies, uh, that's evidence of hyposplenism. Okay, everyone happy? Um, Ask how it is. How... Go on, Ash. Sorry. How do you define? Um, I don't know refractory shock, or you know the, the children where you actually you feel you've adequately tried to resuscitate them, and, and you need to do something else like IR or surgery. So, so, so you get a feel really quickly. So you give them blood products and you see what happens to their physiology. And it's really obvious the children, you, you, you've looked after children. You know that they respond, they're very, very sensitive to fluids and to fluid challenges. Um, and I think, you know, if you have given a significant volume of blood and you still have hypotension, you should be thinking about re-imaging or going to IR. Okay. It's really easy trauma, actually. Does that make sense? Everyone happy? Sarah left. Yes. Good. Good. Thank you very much. Right, it's half past one. Is everyone bored? Should we carry on? Should we stop? Continue, please. So, what was that, Selena? Continue, please. Continue, please. Okay, we're continuing to case three. I can't remember which was one. Was. Oh, this is a cool one. You'll love this. Okay, so this is a four-year-old boy who ran into a non-safety glass door. Did even, did even anything like this exist anymore? Yes, it does, if you're in Watford. And he had multiple lacerations. And he was, he came to his local a and &E, and the local a and &E referred it on to the major trauma center. The conversation on the phone between the major trauma center and the pediatric doctors at the unnamed uh, network hospital suggested that there was some bowel out and the major trauma center trauma team leader said, 
Of course there's not, don't be silly. So, here's a cute little boy who turned up to A&E. Anyone ever seen anything like this before? I'm not easily shocked, but that is horrendous, isn't it? Yeah, so, so uh, um, the, the system did not work terribly well for this little boy. And basically his dad, who was covered in his blood, um, was sitting next to him looking slightly pale. And this child was sitting in A&E like this. Uh, and everyone had sort of looked shocked and hadn't done the thing. What are you going to do if you see this? Push it in. Call no. you. Do, call, 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 call for help, but in the meantime, what you know, cover it easy. You need to cover it and 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 um, keep it moist. Like a Absolutely, it, it is. It, you manage this like a gastroscisis. I'm glad someone said that. So, it's about because I told you that in major trauma, because he's bled lots as well. This child, so we're going to get into what with him. So he's getting cold. He's bled the lots. Triad. Lethal sorry? Yeah, the, the triangle of terror. Um, we, we're going to get into that really quickly. So actually what needs to happen for him is for this to have been covered with some wet gauze, um, not to ask the dad to put their hand on it while they were being transferred in the ambulance so it didn't wiggle around, which is what had happened, which was the dad still slightly traumatised about it three years later. Um, um, but but to cover this up, uh, in terms of urgent imaging and taking to theatre, um, I didn't do any imaging for this uh, because I'm going to do a laparotomy anyway because I'm going to have to look around for some glass. Um, but essentially he had um, a shard of glass which had gone uh, everywhere. I mean he had all sorts of scrapes and cuts everywhere, and it had a huge flap here in the tissue. Um, we had plastic surgeons working on him, he had a big scalp laceration so some neurosurgeons were doing stuff and we were in the abdomen and we opened up the groin and there was a big incision. The glass had gone alongside the femoral artery, uh, but not through the femoral artery, otherwise he would have died. So he was jolly lucky. Case four. Case four. Everyone happy still? Yep. Yes. Not good. Good, good. So case four, more trauma. A 14-year-old son of a Russian oligarch who was sliding down a marble ballast banister in their house. Uh, this and this uh, are linked because I'm not sure many people have got a marble banister. Uh, he came in with right-sided chest pain and coughing up blood. And this is his CT scan. Anyone want to tell us about this? Anybody remember about CT scans? Looks like talking about. He's got a he's got a rib fracture, hasn't he? There, on the I suppose my left. On the right and side so, of the patient. Yeah, so that is now I can't think what it is, but he's got a punctured lung, has he not? Well, yeah. So, so um, is this an arterial or venous phase? Not sure. Where? Yeah, arterial, because we can see the aorta really brightly. Um, uh, and and he's fractured his rib, and the rib has been pushed into the lung. Now, this child, what wasn't actually seen here, was seen somewhere else. Um, and this exemplifies why the trauma team works really well, um, because this bit of rib was sticking into the lung towards the hilum. Um, and the referring centre tried to get advice from Great Ormond Street and the Evelina, where they have paediatric cardiothoracic surgeons, and they had no interest or expertise in the management of paediatric chest trauma. And this is a, a vagary of uh, thoracic trauma. I know we're talking about abdominal injuries, but this is all kind of part of the same problem. Um, there, the cardiothoracic surgeons who live in Great Ormond Street and the Evelina, they are essentially congenital cardiac surgeons. That is their specialty. They have no knowledge or interest in traumatic chest lesions and therefore the best place for a child with a chest wall problem or something going on in the chest is to refer them to one of the major trauma centers okay we've had this multiple times over the last couple of years of people poor pediatric registrars calling around different places 
trying to get advice from people saying we've got a child who we think might have an esophageal perforation in their chest or they might have a significant rib injury or we're worried about an arterial injury in the chest the correct place for them is at a major trauma center okay um so that's all that was about but there's his rib fixed with a little plate which is cute okay case five okay this is let's make this the last case because i said i'd be done in 40 minutes does that sound all right yeah you must be hungry i'm hungry okay so last case 12 year old girl she was texting her friends about something and she fell down some stairs and she landed on a cabinet on her side she had pain in the left side of her abdomen and she had frank hematuria what does she have when she gets into hospital what imaging does she have ct ct, CT. yay everyone gets a ct scan she does not get anything apart from a ct scan and this is her ct scan somebody want to talk about the ct scan what okay what are you expecting to find some sort of kidney or bladder injury a kidney injury sounds like a perfect thing if you've got left side abdominal pain you have blunt abdominal trauma so where is her kidney looks like it might be in two bits yeah, yeah it looks like it's in a million squillion pieces doesn't it but can you see that it's in it's in a different pattern of injury to the spleen whereas the spleen was all in different little bits um this is almost like it's bivalve doesn't it one bit there one bit there there's the right kidney mining its own business what do we do with her mm. not much probably that or i'm sorry i don't know not sure can you do interventional so, radiology Definitely. so what what question what, what information haven't i told you Clinically, what is she like? Stable. So, cl clinically, she is totally and utterly hemodynamically stable. What would you like to do? Nothing. Absolutely right. Let us manage her conservatively. So this would be a grading of a grade five renal laceration. And prior to 2005, the management for this was to operate on all of these kidneys. Okay. And people had all sorts of rationales why uh, and we didn't we, we did nothing for her um, and we followed her up with another ct scan and another ultrasound um, this is the follow-up ct scan she's got lots of fluid around her kidney but what fluid is this blood or urine which one are you going to go for Urine. urine fantastic yeah so if you get kidney injuries you will almost certainly get what's called a urinoma which is a sign that the pelvic calyces have been damaged because if you're damaging the kidney you're going to damage the pelvic calyces okay if you get a urinoma it sits around the kidney if it resolves by itself then it's fine if it stays there or if it gets infected what do we do drain it yeah, in a we stent? Put, yeah we could just put a little drain in we could try and stent the kidney although it's probably very difficult when it's this badly damaged we can certainly drain the urinoma so like, we're not doing a nephrectomy importantly okay and, and and historically things have changed completely um this is her kidney at uh three months down the line in follow-up and it looks like a normal kidney uh what sort of scan is this You paediatricians know this. You, you, you do these scans uh, the whole time. BSMA sort of um, isotope. Uh, is that? Yeah. Yeah. Scan brilliant. Sort of thing. Yeah. So DMSA scan, dimercaptor succinic acid. This is a functional scan. Doesn't tell you anything about excretion. It just tells you about function. Uh, this is her damaged kidney, and you can see that there is certainly some evidence of some scars in it compared to the other side. But it's actually, but actually, her split function is uh, thirty-five percent on the damaged side uh, compared to uh, sixty-five percent on the other side. So she's got a functioning kidney. Is that important for her? 
yeah absolutely so we 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 are we have managed her conservatively uh, and we've left her with a functioning kidney uh, what does she need in terms of follow up Then we just need to make sure the kidney's growing, do you? Nope. No. She probably should just have her blood pressure once a year. Yeah, so uh, yearly blood pressure and a year analysis because we know that renal scars can give you rise to hypertension. She's 12. She's got 70 or 80 years ahead of her. Uh, so it's about plumbing her into the GP system to get regular um, uh, blood pressures and your analysis. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Slightly unrelated. But what uh, information? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what information or additional information does a Mag three scan give you over a DMSA? That is a fascinating question. And if I was a paediatric urologist, I'll tell you. <laughs> but I will tell you. I'll tell you anyway. No. So mm, there are two. Um, uh, um, nuclear medicine scans that we do on kidneys. One is a DMSA, which is purely a functional study. It's actually much, a bit more accurate than a MAG3 in terms of telling your split function, and it's much better at looking at scarring. So if you are looking for evidence of scarring following a UTI, the right test is a DMSA scan. A MAG3 scan is very is good at looking at uptake of dye, so it tells you about function of the kidney, but it also tells you about excretion. So we often use MAG3 scans in looking for a dilated kidney where we're not sure whether this is um, PUJ obstruction or whether this is uh, dilating reflux, yeah, grade four, five reflux. Okay. Okay. And a MAG3 scan is a good scan to do if you want to look for vesicoureteric reflux in an older child because you can do an indirect cystogram. So the dye leaves the kidneys, you watch the bladder with the little camera, and you look for evidence of reflux back up uh, the ureters. So MAG3, good for PJ obstruction, good for looking at reflux in older children, and good for looking at function, but probably not as good at looking for scars. And that's just my simple understanding of nuclear medicine. Thank you. Uh, is that all right? That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, are you bored? Like it's like quarter two. I said I'd be done by forty minutes. I'm bored, but it's up to everyone else as well. <laughs> um, I can't remember what this one is. Is this even a thing? Okay, yeah. So this is this is the final case. Um, and I guess this one is a fifteen-year-old hit by a car off his bike, uh, landed on the curb and was seen in A&E, in ra and &E. He was not tachycardic. He had some mild abdominal tenderness. And what happened to him? So did he, did he get... Hmm? Did he not get a CT? He had a normal urine dipstick and a doctor and a senior doctor decided he didn't need a CT scan and they sent him home. Hmm. 30 minutes later, he came back in as a code red, collapsed on the bus, tachycardic with a tender abdomen, and he ended up having a splenectomy. So that is just to, uh, there's his spleen, smashed a million pieces. Um, oh, this one is a, why did I even show you that one? Okay, so, I mean, I, I think that that is just to, uh, to evidence that, um, that the, the, this um, CT scans are the only answer to imaging, and you should CT scan everyone who's got enough mechanism to get a solid organ injury. So CT scan, so you said CT scan, it was the right thing to do. He didn't get a CT scan, he ended up in trouble. Just final thing, and then we're done, because I must, you must be bored by now listening to me, which run away. So eight-year-old girl fell onto a bench in a school playground. She was a bit tender, but she landed straight onto a bench onto her abdomen. She was a bit tachycardic. What do you want to do for her? Give us some analgesia. Yeah. Uh, people want to CT her. 
And you are absolutely 100% right, because that is the only imaging modality in, major tra in trauma. And this is a CT scan. Tell me once to tell us about it. There's a small child one to tell us about it. Small child, tell us what it is. So CT scan, I'll put you out in misery. Um, it's a portal venous phase because the portal veins lit up as opposed to the artery. And lots of food in her stomach. And she's got a big laceration through her liver. What do we do with her? IR? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Even though she's tachycardic? She was a bit tachycardic. Okay. She, was, she was a bit sore. Um, so you manage these conservatively. Um, I guess the last thing we haven't talked about is um, conservative management. What does that look like? So very briefly, again, in 2000, when they introduced this grading system, they introduced a way of trying to manage people uh, to uh, on bed rest. And uh, it stuck for a very long time. So basically what you would do is you would keep someone in bed rest uh, for the number of days plus the grade of their injury. So if you had a grade two liver laceration, you'd be in bed for three days. If you have grade four liver laceration, you'd be in bed for five days. Uh, and people used to adhere to that rigidly. Uh, I think we're moving away from that now in some centers, certainly we are. Uh, and we're going more on hemodynamics and, and, and uh, uh, whether there's a drop in hemoglobin. Um, so you need uh, good monitoring for the first 12 hours. If you're not tachycardic, if you don't get a drop in HB, um, you're looking at trying not to bed rest these children for a very long time. In terms of going home, what do you do with them? Um, usually we are told to avoid contact sports, trampoline and bicycling until we rescan them at six weeks. Okay, so uh, we do not monitor liver function tests. They'll be deranged and then what are you going to do with them? Uh, the answer is nothing. We know that they're going to be there and know they're going to be up. Um, you would do an ultrasound for this child because potentially this is a hyalur injury, so they might get a bioloma, which might need draining. Uh, so we talked about the principles of trauma. I've talked about imaging, which is super simple. We just do a CT scan, penetrating and blunt a little bit. And we talked about surgery, interventional radiology and doing nothing, which is our default state. Finn, uh, so our protocol here, if you have a CT, is you do a repeat CT scan at three days, uh, which is to look for the development of pseudoaneurysms, and then we do an ultrasound at six weeks. If you work at King's, uh, they tend to use something called bubble ultrasound, um, which you might have seen, um, but, but they're the only centre that uses bubble ultrasound. And then clicking on it, you're going to read into the list.